Lynn, Massachusetts, the city of firsts, where the first tannery in the United States was opened by the New England Company back in the colonial times, now the land of the free stretches, where the first jet engine in the country was assembled, now airbuses and Boeings roam in the skies, overpowering even the gustiest of winds from the ocean, where astronomer Maria Mitchell fell in love with those skies and was the first woman inducted into the Academy of Arts and Sciences, and where on land the first Massachusetts electric trolley ran in 1888, connecting Lynn and the greater Boston area. It was Cambridge where Harvard students were traveling from in 1877 to play a baseball game against the Lynn semi-pro team, the Live Oaks. And this was the first game to showcase a baseball catcher's mask, right here in Lynn. Ever since, the history of baseball sprouted in the city of firsts to later give Lynn its most cherished sports venue, Fraser Field. To understand more about the context of the time Fraser Field first opened as gates to welcome spectators, let us turn to Dr. Brian Bunk, a professor of history at the University of Massachusetts. Uh, the period we're talking about is, of course, known as the Great Depression, which generally began in 1929. And the main source of sources of economic instability were a decline in output and uh, falling prices. So, for example, industrial production fell by almost 50 percent, and gross uh, national product, uh, real GDP, fell by about a third. As a result of those factors, you had incredibly high unemployment, which at its peak was about 20 percent. Uh, there was a the a lack of consumer confidence meant a decline in consumer spending. Um, there was uh, kind of a lack of confidence in the credit and banking system, which led to runs on banks and the closure of many banks. Ooh, sounds very depressing. So did the government attempt any reforms? What did the newly elected President Franklin Delano Roosevelt enact? The New Deal was a series of reforms that were put in place in response to the Great Depression and the economic instability uh, that, that racked the country during those years. It was an attempt really to fix the problems that, were, uh, that existed within the economic system of the United States. Many of these reforms were talked about or were in progress beforehand, but they were all sort of rushed into place. So the government, or at least policymakers, didn't want to provide welfare as a, as a um, solution to unemployment and to widespread poverty. So they came up with this works relief. To, so to give people jobs, uh, often constructing public works projects as a way of alleviating poverty and unemployment during the Great Depression. Well, thank you very much for the clarification, and I've also heard somewhere that Fraser Field was constructed by the WPA, or the Works Progress Administration. Can you elaborate more about the specifics of the WPA and what they did for sports facilities back in the time? WPA projects were uh, focused on recreational facilities like athletic fields and stadiums. Um, there was about 10 percent of the total overall projects that were built during this period were associated with athletics and sports. And the reasons for that are that they provided or they gave an opportunity for relatively uh, labor-intensive projects that were not long-term in terms of the construction. So it provided jobs but didn't um, take potential employees away from private concerns which was always uh, foremost in the minds of policymakers. They didn't want the public works projects to compete with uh, private employers in terms of attracting um, new people. The athletic facilities tended to be popular within their local communities. Uh, they tended to be projects that had a great deal of support. Um, and so that's one reason why stadiums and athletic facilities were, were among the projects that were authorized. Now that we have the historic background, for the purposes of authenticity, let us turn to the actual people involved with Fraser Field. All of them are from Lynn or grew up in the area. In other words, let us add some citizen science to this project. In particular, let us explore how one of the current tenants, North Shore Navigators, has fit into the city of Lynn starting 2012. 
it's served the city very well um, over the years. The Navigators in particular, I mean, we do have the Boston Red Sox 10 minutes down the road, but um, the Navigators definitely provide a good family um, good family entertainment at a, at a very low cost. Um, you constantly see whole families coming on a, on a nice night in the summer and, you know, enjoying food and beverage um, that doesn't break your bank every, you know, to go to a game. So we take a great pride in being members of the community. You know, we're Lynn's baseball team, you know, we really embrace that role, being so close to Boston. A lot of people, you know, gravitate to the Red Sox, rightfully so, but we really try to be the community team, whether it's through local business partnerships, uh, where you know they sponsor us, and you know we return give you know you know outfield fence signs or in between inning promotions, or you know one of our favorite things to do is participate with the lo uh, local little leagues, whether it means going to their parades, whether it means inviting them here for you know to run the bases during the game, before the game, you know we try to do our best to make it a family friendly atmosphere that welcomes the community. And I, I think that's demonstrated especially that all of our products, uh, our concessions, so our burgers, our hot dogs, our pizza, uh, they're all from Lynn businesses. And I think that's important if you want to be successful in this industry. Fraser Field is our crown jewel built by the WPA in 1940. Um, has a rich history. Plenty of major leaguers have played here. Uh, it's hosted minor league ball. Currently, it's home to all five high schools here in Lynn, and a team, the North Shore Navigators, that play in the Futures Collegiate League, as well as hosted numerous tournaments throughout the summer. Uh, so I have been with the team officially. This is going to be my third year, but because of the other uh, roles that I've had, I've uh, been around the team for a long time and being from the area I've gone there uh, kind of my whole life so uh, definitely uh, it, it's been a while so I've uh, kind of grown up with the place and uh, now but this is my official third year working for the team uh, but I've also written about the team for not only the baseball journal but for the Lynn item newspaper which is the big newspaper in the in the city as well. It's kind of a gem in the North Shore I mean uh, it, it goes back again to what I earlier stated with the Lynn, the Lynn Sailors it was a uh, you know a farm affiliate triple-a farm affiliate and uh, and you know a lot of great memories from my high school uh, you know St. Mary's graduate uh, I seen St. Mary's baseball team uh, play there and they're, uh, they're probably about five I think five state championships now uh, I've just seen a lot of great athletes. I got to throw in a first pitch uh, a couple of years ago, and that was a great experience. Um, I, I, I just enjoyed having them around. It, it just, it's, it's, a, it's another wonder of Lynn. So Lynn is the eighth biggest city in the Commonwealth, uh, supporting 95,000 people. And the stadium sits right in the middle of the city, you know, surrounded by residential areas, surrounded by some commercial area. And it offers a great opportunity for the community to get involved. You know, we've seen stadiums where they're kind of on the outskirts of a town and, you know, a little tougher to get to, but right now, this stadium is walkable to a lot of residents. It's on bus routes, which is important. You know, it's an easy you know, bus trip across the city to get here. Um, and I think it's important because it allows the community to be able to get here easily as far as there are five high schools in the city of Lynn. And having this as the center point of the city is a great opportunity for the youth to get involved and be able to come to the games. Lynn is famous for their sports and um, a lot of great athletes and Fraser Field has been home to a lot of great memories so when you talk sports you think Fraser Field and Manning Field. I grew up in nearby Saugus so I got to play some high school games here as long as uh, in American Legion games it's a great facility um, I've had the pleasure of hitting a couple of home runs here which it's not an easy park to hit home runs but um, it's a fantastic facility for high school and, and college baseball. Um, and it's an opportunity. Kids come here and their eyes light up. 
it's a just a fantastic venue for them to play their games. I was always a fan of the Lynn Sailors growing up in Lynn, uh, so I attended the Lynn Sailors game and that was the closest thing we got to a professional franchise. I was born in Lynn, I've lived in Lynn my whole life, and growing up I remember going to the Massachusetts Mad Dogs games, and then a, a little older I remember going to the North Shore Spirit games. So those were independent league teams, so these were you know, paid players. And so it was a little different than what we have now, but I remember some of my best childhood memories growing up coming down to this field. Uh, I remember I, it was a proud moment for me back then, but uh, during Mad Dogs games, they would have contests who could bark the lot of us would get a, a free pizza. So I'm proud to say I did win a couple free pizzas back in the day. I remember back, um, I think it was 81 or 82, Roger Clemens was pitching for the Elmira Red Sox double A team and he pitched here and I know that they they packed the place um, to see him play because he was you know he was a big prospect for the Red Sox in locally you know in Lynn um, so I remember that being packed um, even before that though there's been some some good history of baseball coming through here Ted Williams played here um, so you know over the over the over time, we've had some, some really good baseball in here and filled the stadium on many occasions. So basically, I take care of the stadium here on a day-to-day on -day basis for the last four years. Um, some of the routine tasks are we have to cut the grass, even though the infield is artificial turf. The outfield is natural grass, so we have to maintain that, fertilize it. Um, general upkeep. Of, of the whole field, the warning track and things like that. Make sure that the stadium's up to snuff, make sure it's clean and properly maintained. So uh, it's one of my pleasures. I love being here. Um, it's a fantastic facility and I like to make sure that the kids have a quality field to play on every time they step on this field. I had a great relationship with the late Bill Turlecki. Um, uh, I got to meet him on a, uh, on a professional level when he was a member of the Linnet Area Chamber of Commerce. And uh, Bill was just a guy that you just wanted to support. He loved to breathe baseball, but he also, he, took, he adopted our community and the, um, and the relationship really started off with him. So obviously, uh, the stadium, being close to 80 years old, doesn't have a lot of the modern day amenities that newer stadiums would have. So we have our clubhouse that uh, includes uh, three offices, uh, a home locker room, and the bathrooms. I mean, when I say locker room, it's, it's uh, just an open room with hooks on the wall. Uh, so that's a little tough. I mean, it, I think in an ideal world, you know, you would see an actual office building you would see locker rooms for both teams and umpires you know obviously these have associated costs that you know unless the city comes a, across a, a good set, a chunk of change then uh, we wouldn't be able to update those right away but obviously being 80 years old there's going to be parts of the stadium that are going to need help uh, we saw this year that the roof started pieces of the roof started to crumble uh, the city to their credit fixed the problem within a couple weeks uh, you know they were able to find you know some money to help fix the roof and really come up with a permanent fix that makes it safe and that we can you know keep the stadium open the next I think the next and probably the most pressing issue is uh, the light fixtures uh, again these lights are the original so they are the light poles are close to 80 years old so I think the next important thing is not only fixing the lights but I think replacing the lights would be the ideal situation. Now, over the years we have seen significant improvements done by the city and that includes you know the tarping of the field and it's been a great partnership with the city of Lynn. It was rebuilt in the 70s the last time it was rebuilt and then it's been uh, fixed a couple times recently 2011 was the last extensive work that they did. Um, they c actually cut off like a foot and a half of the overhang back a little bit as it was chipping away. Um, this past summer, we had um, some fallen debris where we had to act and the only feasible solution f because of the money situation was to put the safety netting up underneath it. So we had a company come in and chip 
chip away anything that was loose. And then we put this safety net, kind of like this, the netting that, that you would see under bridges when they were working on it. Um, it's a long-term temporary solution until we can figure out something better. Um, still trying to keep the old nostalgia of the of the stadium. Since Fraser Field's been renovated, it's kind of the the existing. Uh, there's been a lot of history there, but it is all new since that happened, um, or since it was built, I should say. Um, but yeah, definitely, uh, it's a very historic place, and, and you kind of see it with just some of the names that have walked through there, like Ted Williams. Even with its, you know, perceived defects, I think that the residents across the city would agree that, you know, this is a special place for us, and that, you know, we wouldn't trade it. So, you know, as far as limitations for the team, I don't think there really is any. I, I think that um, we just take it with stride and we learn to adapt to the, to the different issues that the stadium holds. Could it be better? Yeah, but a lot of things could be better. You know, we like our stadium and we wouldn't do anything different with it. Well, I know speaking the, the cantilever roof that's over the grandstands, I believe there's only two other roofs like that in the whole United States. So that's a very, very unique feature. Um, some of the added, obviously at one point this was an all natural grass field with a clay infield. Um, 10 years ago, the initial turf went in when the North Shore Spirit came in. The stadium itself is as pretty much as original as you're gonna get. You know, the the one part of the stadium that everyone kept, you know, is, is historic, is the roof. It was the longest overhanging roof. Over the years, the roof has scaled back a little because it's starting to crumble, it's all cement. So it's, it's a little shorter now, but that's, you know, a, a part that's really kept close to actually the residents. Um, the major upgrade that took place was to the infield dirt, where that was replaced with uh, turf field. Uh, and the goal is to actually replace the outfield with turf as well. But that will come down the line. But other than that, I mean, what you see is what you get. You know, it, it's been here. There's been some seat upgrades, but other than that, it, it's been, it, it's the original Fraser Field that was made in 1940. Um, I know the dugouts were put in, the dugouts used to be field level um, back in the day. We dug them so that you, you take a couple steps down and made it kind of like a, almost like a professional, more of a professional dugout than it was. Um, the light poles are original and we're constantly repairing those. We're looking to upgrade and, you know, the way the stadium is here um, and just make it more energy efficient, cost efficient. Bullpens were always always been on field. We've had um, over various time periods. We've had batting cages underneath the stadium, um, and then you know, and then we have them. We we've made batting cages out back behind the stadium for some of the teams to uh, go hit up there. Since I've been around the, the team, the, the Navigators and the, the Spirit were the team that I grew up watching and, and I know a lot of the recent players have talked about the same thing. Uh, ever since then was actually when the most recent renovation was completed. They're always tinkering with different things to, to make it look right for the coming year. But, uh, but since 2003 uh, was the Spirit. Uh, was the Spirit's existence. And in 2003 was when the, the turf came in and there was, uh, when they were a professional team, there was a, a video scoreboard and uh, kind of more amenities than you need for a college league. Um, we're currently searching for some more available funds. Um, we've had a couple meetings with our mayor, Tom McGee and our CFO also been in talks with the Navigators and Fisher College is uh, um, one of our primary tenants over at Frasia for their spring season and their fall season. We, with the help of Fisher College, we received 
a grant with the Cal Ripken Foundation, um, a matching grant, um, which is going to help us do sort of our wish list. The city has a wish list for the stadium to kind of keep it unique with the roof and um, and the you know the the stands and and whatnot, but also bring it up to date, so to speak, a little bit. We plan on turfing the outfield as well. So right now we have a turf infield, grass outfield. We're going to potentially turf the whole field for maintenance purposes. The, the stadium need, needs constant upkeep, which a lot of times we don't have the ability to do it, so it needs to get contracted out. But I would say overall for a stadium that's close to 80 years old, that it's in um, not bad shape. There's some major projects that, that need to be done, and, and they'll be done in the future. But I would say overall, it's in it's in pretty good shape considering how old it is. We want to fix the roof, and we also want to do some upgrades underneath the stadium to make it more of a like, you know, first class facility um, that it once was, um, you know, back in the 30s and 40s. We've had a lot of good community moments where, you know, we've had thousands of people at the stadium before, but I think the one that sticks out the most for me is back in 2017, we had an awareness night for suicide awareness. Uh, suicide awareness obviously being an important topic that's tough to talk about, uh, tough to really raise awareness because it's, it's an uncomfortable t subject for a lot of people. And you know, we brought out a family of a local high school graduate who had committed suicide, and they spoke to the crowd. They spoke to the 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 team, you know, everyone here. And we had a candlelight vigil. And although it was a somber moment, it was an important moment that really brought the community and the team together. When we host events over there, whether it's a Navs game or any other event at Fraser Field, all the local establishments benefit from from it um you know we host a couple um we had a concert over the summer and a lot of you know a lot of local places were filled before the concert and you know people come in get dinner before that and then they come to the stadium and it's a it's a benefit for the businesses and the city itself it's hard to gauge if i get a, a personal influx but i see more of an influx in the community uh, i see a lot of people pouring in from all parts of north shore and Greater Boston to come see the Navigator. So there is a draw there. Um, uh, what I love about it is I get to see, meet new players every year. Uh, and I don't know if it's a requirement from the Navigators, but uh, uh, these kids are just not only tremendous baseball players, but they're uh, tremendous high character individuals. So that's a, that's a great attribute to the uh, organization, the Navigators. Whenever you go to a game, you always see, there's always little leagues and camp groups, and there's always, uh, uh, in the past, there's always been uh, a couple of dates uh, that the team plays in the morning. So uh, school groups can come out and camp groups can come out when it's the, the summertime. So um, all kinds of different uh, community activities. The players are really good about uh, kind of being around the kids and signing autographs and playing uh, different games on the field between innings. So it's a very big, uh, very big part of the community. Having something in the community that the the residents can bond over or really get behind and support I think is is really important and so growing up you know seeing guys who again when I talked about earlier how the kids looked at the players as you know professional players that's exactly I remember going back here I think of guys like Yuri Sanchez and Vic Davila which if you're not from Lynn you know you don't know who those guys are but I remember coming down here and thinking those guys you know were as good as Red Sox players. And I think that's really important for the kids to have role models to look up to in the community. You know, tangible ones. Obviously, kids are going to look up to professional athletes, but what are the chances they get to meet those players? You know, when you come down to a Mad Dogs or a Spirit or, you know, a Navigators game, you get to meet, you know, someone who you consider an idol. We have five high schools in the city of Lynn that also use the field for their high school baseball season. Um, so with the five high schools, the NAVs, the Navigators, and Fisher College, um, as well as we host um, a couple big tournaments. We, co we host the high school tournament 
um, at the end of June. Um, so it's it's very used. With the Futures Collegiate Baseball League, the league that we play in, the rule is half of the Ross has to be from New England. So we do get a lot of local high school kids, whether it's from here in Lynn or the surrounding communities, that maybe came to these games as a kid and they wanted to be a part of it and now they're taking that next step in their professional or career and being able to play in front of a crowd that, that's a nice thing to see too you know we've had kids you know who used to come to the games. I remember seeing uh, as an employee and now they're our starting shortstop it's it, it's a great cycle all of the teams in the in the league are really about uh, kind of involving the community and the different things that they do um, it isn't like any other level of baseball really where the major league affiliate or something like that is is controlling what goes on it's completely everything's done from the local level so there are always schools involved little league involved camps involved so it's a big uh, it's a big draw in the community the the team is very supportive of other things that go on and it's just uh, everything about the team is all involved in the community the new ownership group is completely uh, completely part of the community, so it's a it's a big draw around the the North Shore, just like all the other teams in the in the league are are around in the same realm. When when you first walk in here, your first time, I know for me, you walk in here and as as a high schooler, it, it's a major league stadium, dugouts that go down in the ground, and you have to take a few steps. Um, it's just a, a, a wonderful place to play and it's just a great opportunity to play here. It's a fantastic venue. It's, it's rare to have someone stay for multiple years. You know, that happens maybe, you know, every couple of years we'll have someone to come back. But we've been really lucky with the players that we have brought in over the years that they really do embrace the crowd. Um, they, they go above and beyond. Like uh, this year, for example, you know, Colin Wetero from St. John's University would make a point to stay and play catch with the kids after the game on the field. And although you know these are just college kids coming in, to the kids that come from the community, it makes it seem like they're playing catch with a professional baseball player. You know, the amount of autographs that get asked, it, it really instills a great relationship between the players and and the, the kids of the community which is, is truly special and the fact that these young men these individuals also reached out to the community and supported our youth programs as well so the engagement has actually growing and I can see it trending even more and more as it goes along especially now with the January family The main road coming into the city of Lynn is um, Linfield Street, Route 129. Um, you have various restaurants slash bars um, right along that. Um, as you come in, there's Dock 125, um, which is right on the water, right on the pond, which is a beautiful setting. And then right around that corner, you have the Four Winds, same type of setting on the pond. Um, you have the Lazy Dog, which is a sports bar right in Wyoming Square, as well as Rollies. And then John's Roast Beef is, uh, I mean, he um, he's a constant supporter of the Navigators. Um, I mean, I eat there often. You can go there every day, and uh, you see local Lynn guys, stadium guys um, that are in there. The Navigators uh, play pretty good when after after a John's Roast Beef meal. Oh, it, it's in a perfect location. Plenty of parking. Um, easy access from the highway. It's only a 10-minute ride from the highway. Uh, when we host teams from out of state, there's plenty of hotel venues. Um, it's just a great place, easy access, handicap accessible. Um, it's a great place to watch a ball game. And um, when they picked this property to build this stadium, they actually nailed it. It's just the perfect spot for it. Fraser Field is part of now a complex of Two fields, there's Manning Field, so that kind of gets used during the, the rest of the year. I know Fisher College in Boston also uses the field, so they play their games there, and they kind of take up a part of the year that isn't being used as much, so they kind of play their games September, October, 
uh, November to get ready for their regular spring season when they come back. And the navigators are just a small part of the year, but a lot of people, it's kind of one of those, anywhere with turf is kind of a destination. And there's a complex in Northborough, Massachusetts, has three fields in it actually. And they can be cleared off the snow by February. They're playing baseball games as long as the weather, as it's going on, cooperates with that. No, there's nothing wrong with the location. It's perfectly uh, suited next door to uh, Manning Field as well. Uh, plenty of parking and it's access to two major roadways, uh, Boston Street and Western Ave. So it's e very easy to accessible, highly accessible. Fisher College has been great. They, they're out of the Fenway area, um, and there's just not a lot of real estate up in that direction. And they were, before they settled in Lynn, they were, they were bouncing from stadium to stadium, kind of finding a, a good fit. They were up in Haverhill. They would, you know, they were in a bunch of different places. And they ended up being in Lynn. Um, we're in talks now of extending their lease and making it even further out somewhere in the 10 year range. Uh, they're committing themselves to Lynn and we're committing the stadium to them too. Um, the same with the Navigators, their, their lease is up after next season, this current season. They have an option for three years to extend, which they've already expressed that they want to do so. And the new owners are looking to also extend it another three years after that. So that would be another seven years that the Navigators are in, in the city of Lynn, which is fantastic. This is the first non-professional team that's existed there, so it's coming up on on 80-year anniversary of the field, and all of the other uh, all of the other teams have been uh, have been affiliated or have been professional. Not all affiliated with major league teams, but at at the beginning there were major league affiliates with several uh, organizations, and then the two most recent teams, to the Navigators, were independent professional teams, so they were still. Uh, they were still professionals and getting paid to play, but um, not quite in the, obviously not affiliated with a major league team. I know that the Red Sox, to, to go to a game, to bring, you know, say you have a family of four to go to a game, I mean, with parking and, and concessions and all and ticket prices you're looking at five hundred dollars on a minimum night when you could come here and watch a game for fifty dollars um, and feed your family and and see good baseball um, the baseball really is good it's and it's been the navigators have worked hard for their roster to to bring in good talent local talent as well as talent around the country to uh, to make it really good baseball one sentence about the North Shore Navigators, it's been an honor and privilege to be a part of the North Shore Navigators for the past nine years, to work for the team that I grew up watching, whether it was the Mad Dogs or the Spirit, but to watch a baseball team thrive in my hometown has been a great thing for me. It's been a great thing for the community, and I wouldn't give back the last nine years for anything. I love being here. This is, I love, I take pride in how this field looks and I want everybody to be happy when they come here and play. The neighbors of the Navigators have been a great partner of ours and uh, we're wishing the new ownership much success and I look forward to working with them. Thank you very much for your attention uh, and watching this short documentary. It was truly a pleasure for me to film with all those wonderful people you saw in the video and be in the city of Lynn as well as intern for the North Shore Navigators back in summer of 2016. I wouldn't trade it for anything, just like Joe Gill said.